right, welcome. It's so exciting to have so many of you here tonight. Um, this is our discipleship series, a vision for life groups. So you've probably heard over the last few weeks, maybe even months, Father Ben speaking of life groups, Father Lawrence and Father Marcus also sort of have been talking about it. And this is something new that we are doing. It's not necessarily new in the church. Small groups, life groups, prayer groups have been around for centuries. But this is something new and intentional that we're doing here at St. Morris. So before we begin, let me introduce myself. My name is Stephanie Dresch. If any of you emailed lifegroups at stmorrisparish.com, I'm the person that emailed you back. So it's just me. Uh, and I'm the Life Groups Ministry Coordinator. So I'll be emceeing over these next five weeks and really accompanying you as we unfold this new vision of Life Groups in the parish. So just a little bit about myself so that you can feel comfortable around me. So I work full time as a missionary with Catholic Christian Outreach, or CCO for short, and I work in our finance team as a finance team coordinator. So my disclaimer whenever I tell anyone that I work in our finance team is that one, I do not have a financial background. Two, I passed my first year university calculus course with a 52%, so that shows something. And three, my degree is in technical theater. So I'm like behind the scenes, all in black, making sure everyone else on stage is looking great. So this is like a little outside of my own comfort zone. So you're in with it, we're all in here together. And so we're on this journey. Um, so again, I'm not good at math, so please don't make me do math but I am really good with systems, and I'm good with leading people, hence the team coordinator position. So I've been working with CCO for 10 years now, and I've lived in, the, in these last 10 years in Halifax, Winnipeg, Kingston, and now Ottawa. So I move around a lot. Probably not anytime soon though, so we're here. So another small fact uh, about me is that I love tea. And specifically, Tim Hortons steep tea, double double, cream, not milk. <laughs> it literally runs through my veins. And I'm only mildly, mildly obsessed with an organizational team health consultant and author, Patrick Lencioni. If anyone has heard of him, you're my new best friend. Um, so he wrote the books, The Five Dysfunctions of a Team and The Working Geniuses. And I literally actually would drop everything and work for him if that's what the Lord wanted for me, because he's amazing. So if you don't know who he is, come talk to me afterwards and I'll tell you all about him and what he does. If you do know who he is, come talk to me anyways, so I can just like <laughs> fangirl, please. I love him. But who I love more is Jesus. I love Jesus. I encountered Jesus when I was 19 years old, my second year of university, after not having, I've like, grown up Catholic, but the most was just the Catholic education system in Ottawa, in Ontario. I'm from small town Russell, if anyone knows where that is. So when I moved to Ottawa, I kept telling people, I don't know Ottawa, I'm not from the city, I'm from Russell, the most I know is Saint Laurent. <laughs> so even coming out here was like, I live out in that area, and I'm like, coming out here, I'm like, I don't know where I am. But I met Jesus. I encountered him in a night of adoration and through confession when I was 19, and it changed my life. He changed my life. And so for 13 years, I've been living my own journey and discipleship with Jesus. And for those 10 years working with CCO, bringing other university students who were like myself to know him. And now, working in our head office, I do all the behind the scenes work to make sure that our campus missionaries can do their job on campus. So, enough about me and my little quirks. You are here. You are here tonight because in some way, shape, or form, you're interested in learning more about these life groups, about this new ministry that we are launching. 
So whether you're just feeling it out right now, just trying to see, okay, do I want to be a part of this? Or you know you want to start your own life group. Either way, you chose to be here tonight and you responded to that invitation to come. So I thank you for being here. This series is meant to cast vision of what life group groups can be in the parish and to start giving some practical formation on how to form and facilitate groups. But the series is just a launching pad for what life groups will be in the coming weeks, months, and years. It's like I'm reminded of what Father Lawrence said just this past weekend of the parish is celebrating 60 years, it's life groups at 60, it's only the start. This is just the start. So whether you are creating one or you're joining a life group, this series is just to help, see, help you see why we're launching them and what they can look like. So these evenings will consist of a talk, uh, some personal reflection time, small group, and sometimes large group sharings. So it'll last about an hour to an hour and a half, depending on who's speaking, what they're talking about. So just clearing away some of the logistics of the evening. Now you kind of know what to expect. So tonight's session is simply titled, A Vision for Life Groups. And I will be your speaker tonight, so sorry if you're already annoyed with my voice. You're going to have to listen to me for at least another 15 to 20 minutes. But we're all here, and the Lord knows. So to transition into this session on a vision for life groups, I wanted to start by actually sharing the story of how I became a parishioner at St. Morris. So I moved to Ottawa in August 2020. Now you might be wondering, hmm, wow, why does that 2020 sound so familiar? <laughs> That's the kind of reaction I was hoping to get, so thank you. But yes, like we all know that 2020 was the beginning of the pandemic, and yes, I did move here for work in the early months of said pandemic when everything was kind of crazy and chaotic. That was not fun, but the Lord made a way. But at that time, churches had only just started opening their doors again, and you often had to register to go to Mass. So being new to the city, I didn't really know where to go or how to discern which parish to join in the midst of the chaos of this pandemic, where it was just hard to get in anywhere. And it was mass, mass times were limited. So from August until Christmas, I went to St. Pat's downtown because it was one of the only churches that had one of those um, first come, first serve type signups for mass where you just had to go there and then sign up and then you were in. And that was just easy for me at the time. It was convenient. But I was alone in that church. I was quiet. I was invisible. And all I did was come for mass and then leave. And then you might remember, if you're following my timeline, what happened next. December 26th, 2020, the day after Christmas, we had our first stay-at-home lockdown order. Everything closed again. Door shut, complete isolation. But everything went back to being online again, including Mass. So as I was planning like which New Year's Mass I would attend online, I looked up St. Morris because I had friends who were parishioners here who just had mentioned it. And I knew of the Companions, loved the Companions. I worked in Halifax. I got to work with like Father Rob Arsner when he was there. So I was like, let me try out one of the Companion parishes. And so New Year's Day 2021, so January 1st, 2021, the online Mass, that was the first time that I attended St. Morris. And since that Mass, I've stayed. Obviously, I'm still here. Um, it was the liturgy, the worship, the, the preaching, and the high quality of the live stream that kept me coming back week after week in those early weeks of lockdown. Like I said, I have a technical theater background, studied a little bit of film, so like, live stream, well done, everyone. But I was excited when the churches started to open up again, and I could finally come back in person to St. Morris. But that first Mass in person was, well, hard. It was hard to actually be there because it was good to be back in person 
And it was beautiful to receive our Lord in the Eucharist and not just through my car window, which was an awesome initiative, by the way. But I realized just how isolated and alone I still was. I was anonymous, invisible. No one talked. No one said hi. And for months, and really the first year of me being here, that was my reality. And it was the reality of the pandemic as a whole. Isolation, anonymity, loneliness. Now, thankfully, that's not my experience anymore. <laughs> I put myself out there to meet new people, to get involved, to introduce myself. But that experience, though, like living through that pandemic, taught me something that is vital in life. We're not meant to live life alone and isolated. And indeed, we cannot live that way. God himself in Genesis says, it is, good, it is not good that man should be alone. It is not good that man should be alone. It's one thing to be around others and another to know those that you are around, to share in life together to not only know of the people who sit beside you or across from you, but to really know those people. And as Father Ben has said before, not just to know in your mind, but to know in your knower, your heart. Not just to know in your mind, but to know in your heart, in your knower. To know each other in our joys and struggles, in our successes and challenges. And I love how St. Paul, in the first letter to the Thessalonians, he says it so clearly. He says, he says, so deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves. So deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves to share our own selves, to share our very lives with each other. Well, what does that even look like to share our own selves with one another? St. Paul, after he proclaimed the gospel, he stayed and lived among the Thessalonians for a short while. He continued to teach and preach, yes, but he worked with them. He shared meals with them. He laughed, he, he played, he, he worshipped with them. He lived life with them. The good parts of life and the poverty and the suffering. He shared every aspect of life with them. He shared all of himself, his very self. So deeply do we care for you that we are determined to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own selves. This, this shared life, this being here for one another in all things is the essence of what these life groups are all about. And how I like to think of it and call it is living life together. Who are the people we are living life together with, that we're doing life with? Now, this doesn't mean that we're all gonna move to the same cul-de-sac and live side by side in their houses. It's not what I'm saying. But what it does mean is intentional and purposeful community groups who live and share in life and fellowship together to, as St. Paul said, deeply care for the other that we want to share our very selves with them. But why? Why is this so important? Why does this even matter? Well. It goes back to my original story. We aren't meant to, and indeed cannot, live life alone or in isolation. It is not good that man should be alone. So coming out of the pandemic, one of the things that I've been hearing more of recently is how we are now living, of North America in particular, is now living as a result of the pandemic in an epidemic of loneliness an epidemic of loneliness. 
And I first heard about this at the Global Leadership Summit in October when one of the speakers, Liz Bohanan, she spoke on this topic of an epidemic of loneliness. And she said, she was quoting from some kind of whatever survey and things that they had done, but she said that 67% of people, so two out of three people, would say that they're currently struggling with loneliness, but that less than 12% of those people would actually admit it and say that they are lonely. And then she continued to say that we aren't alone in feeling alone, even though we might feel like we are, but we are not alone in feeling alone and that we have nothing to be ashamed of in feeling lonely, and that it had nothing to do with our worth as human beings, but that actually our loneliness was a signal that we have an unmet need and desire for connection, and that that's how God created us. I was like, wow, yes. Like when she said that, like it hit me hard. It really resonated me with me, and I, I realized that I could admit that that's what I had experienced throughout the pandemic. And that when I was first here, yeah, I was lonely. I also lived alone in a basement apartment, so that didn't help. <laughs> but I could admit that, yes, I was lonely, and I still felt that. And that sometimes I do still feel that even now. We can be surrounded by so many people, even familiar people and still be lonely. But that's not what God intended for us. That's not how he intended for us to live. That is not how he created us. And God modeled for us, through Jesus and his 12 apostles, how he wants us to live in community. Through small groups that, where we can gather, we can eat, we can pray, we can share and learn from one another, where we live our lives together in communion. And this is, what, this is what I hope for and envision for St. Morris, that our parish would be built on communion and union with God and one another, that these life groups would be a foundation for community within our parish, that parishioners would have people here to share their life with, to live life together as Jesus did with his apostles and as St. Paul did with the Thessalonians. That we as parishioners would know in our knowers those people that are around us every Sunday and beyond. And I'm convicted of the need for this. I've spent much of the last 10 years as I kind of introduced myself, moving from one province to another, one city to the next always building new relationships, but not necessarily having this kind of depth of community to turn to and lead on. And then realizing the feeling of loneliness that this brought. I constantly had to, in some ways, start over every two to three years. And it was hard. It was a blessing, because it was what the Lord called me to, but it was also hard and brought these feelings of loneliness. So now I'm seeing more and more just how vital this is. It's not just a nice thing to do. We're not just doing a nice thing here at St. Morris with Life Groups. It is vital. It is vital in order to thrive and live in the fullness of what God has for each one of us. And that's why we're doing this. So these life groups are built on Four pillars is what we're calling it. Four pillars. So it's communal, vulnerable, missional, and formative. These four pillars that were our foundation for these life groups are communal, vulnerable, missional, and formative. And today and over the next like five weeks, we'll um, go deeper into each one of these pillars. But right now, I actually want to focus on the communal aspect and a little bit of the vulnerable aspect. So I've already been sharing of the need to not do life alone. And there's this age-old adage of, it takes a village to raise a child. Have you heard of that? It takes a village to raise a child. Well, the same is true in our life and in our spiritual lives. It takes a village to grow and mature 
in our relationship and discipleship with Jesus. The journey to heaven and sainthood isn't easy, so we need a village to support, encourage, and challenge us along the way. But who are these people in our lives? Who are the people that we want in our village? Who is in your village? And maybe there are already people coming to mind. And if that is the case, that's amazing. Like maybe those are the people that Jesus has already placed in your life and on your heart to share and live life with, to live a life group with. But maybe no one is coming to mind. But maybe there's a desire or a yearning for that, for that kind of friendship, for that kind of relationship. And Jesus is the one who's placing that on your heart. He wants to bring those people to you for each of us. And it's because we are created for relationship. We are created for relationship with God and with others. We are created for communion and community. To know in our knower is to form deep and genuine friendship. That kind of friendship, that kind of genuine friendship requires authentic sharing, which requires courageous vulnerability. And that's not always easy. Simple, maybe, but, but simple doesn't always mean easy. To share ourselves, our life, our spiritual life, the good, the hard, the joys, and the suffering, to be authentic and genuine, that is hard. But it's worth it. It bonds people together when we can be authentic and real. It brings a deeper level of trust with someone that shows, I can be real with you, and you can be real with me. And truthfully, we all need that. We all need that. So I want to tell you a story. I have a friend. I have many friends, but I have a particular friend. Her name is Michelle. And I asked her if I could tell her, like, tell this, this story. Um, and I, like, had written it out because I felt the Lord was like, share this story. And then I sent her a text of it. And it was funny because she was like, we've never talked about it, but that's exactly how I would explain our relationship. So I was like, great. That's awesome. But I have this friend. Her name is Michelle. So we met 10 years ago when I first started working with CCO. Uh, in the first five years of knowing each other, we were merely acquaintances. She joined staff a year after I had, and I started supporting her ministry in a financial way because there was something about her and how she loved Jesus and loved the mission that I really loved. And I was like, I want to support that. But that was it. That was the extent of our relationship. For five years, it was us knowing each other because we were both staff and me supporting her financially. But in my fifth year with CCO, I became a campus team leader at Queen's University. And uh, essentially it means I oversaw and led the campus movement there in Kingston. And Michelle was also a team leader, but here in Ottawa at Carleton. So we were both team leaders in that same time. And the, that fall of my first year, uh, first semester of, of being a team leader, all the team leaders from our region, so from Ontario and East, uh, we all gathered for a few days of meetings and, and retreat. And it was during this gathering, we all had a chance to share how our semester on campus was going so far. And we were encouraged to be honest and real with one another. Now, up to that point, my semester had been really hard. I was on a team with only one other person, and we were supposed to be, to be a team of four. But I was on a team with only one other. We had no male missionaries, so it was just myself and my female coworker. And there was a lot of division among our students and within our community of our chaplaincy and CCO. So I was really overwhelmed. I was leading our women's ministry. I was leading our men's ministry. And I am a woman, and that is hard to sometimes lead a bunch of 20-year-old men in their face studies and trying to get them catalyzed. It was, it was a very learning experience. And I was also just overwhelmed with dealing with the amount of fractured relationships and learning how to be a team leader and lead someone who was also getting very sick at that time. So on, often I was on campus alone. 
And so going into these meetings where we're asked to share honestly and to be real with each other, I basically was like, I don't want to do that. I would much rather say I'm okay and pretend that everything was fine when it obviously wasn't. But when it came time for me to share, and I was the last to share, so I had heard everyone else share, I made the choice. I made the choice to be honest and real and share the struggles and the reality because I heard everyone else do the same. It wasn't all peachy keen as I thought it was. So sharing my experience to the 12 that were there and hearing their real struggles and successes, it brought so much unity among us as team leaders. It brought us together as a community of leaders to support and lean on. Now, going back to my friend Michelle, so obviously we were both there, we were both team leaders, so we were both together experiencing this, and that same night after I shared, we both ended up just staying up really late and just talking and sharing even in like more in depth of like what we were going through on campus. And I would say, and she would agree, that I only learned last night, that that day and that night, we started a bond. We started to share a bond that was beyond just, I support you as a missionary, we're coworkers, we're team leaders together, but there was something real that started. And in the following years, we continued as team leaders together. We moved into our national office together at the same time. We became managers together. And our vulnerability with each other and our friendship grew and that bond grew and we had opportunities to continue to grow in being vulnerable with each other. And that only strengthened our friendship. And even recently, just last month, like three weeks ago, we were hanging out together and we were just like, wow, we feel free. We feel freedom to be real with one another to be real about our lives, where we're at, about our relationships with the Father, with our relationships with Jesus. But being able to say like, right now life is hard and prayer is really hard and the Father is silent, like I don't hear his voice right now, but I'm gonna keep trying and it sucks right now. But the Lord is good and here's what we're doing. Like, what do you, like, you've experienced that, we're experiencing that, like, how, what are you doing right now? and able to be real with each other and to lean on each other and to support and encourage each other. She's someone that I realize is in my village. She's someone that I live life with and want to live life with. But it took courage and vulnerability to go from just knowing of her and supporting her in her ministry to knowing her and to be known by her. It was in being vulnerable that I was able to be real and authentic, and it deepened our friendship. Now imagine this. Imagine meeting in your life group, monthly, maybe even weekly, to grow in this kind of deep and genuine friendship with the same village of people. Imagine for yourself what that could look like. Imagine meeting intentionally to share in your life and your life with Jesus first and foremost. We wouldn't be alone. We wouldn't be alone in life's struggles. We would have others to celebrate the winds of life with too. We would have people like how the apostles had each other to follow Jesus with. And isn't that what we want and need, is to follow Jesus and to do it with others so we're not alone. And this, this is the spirituality of communion that Father Ben has been mentioning. This is the communal aspect of life groups, this communal pillar of life groups, sharing our own selves in community with others. And I mentioned earlier that we're living in this epidemic of loneliness. 
Like, we can't fight against loneliness alone. It's not a battle that we'll win. We need to do it together. We need to have the people here. You can look around and you may see one person that you know. Imagine if you were fighting that battle, that epidemic of loneliness, together. Imagine that you were able to share life in a deep, genuine, authentic, and intentional way with someone. And maybe you already have some of those people. But maybe it's just a, we meet every so often for coffee. Imagine if that was intentionally monthly or weekly, bi-weekly, whatever it is. But imagine what life could be. Imagine what it would look like to walk into St. Morris on a Sunday and know in your knower the people around you. To know like, hey, I'm gonna go up to you because I know that because we've shared together that things have been hard this week. I'm gonna ask you, how was it? <clears throat> Rather than just saying hi in the distance and leaving. It's why communion and community are vital in life and in growing in Christ. As Jesus had his 12 apostles, and the 12 had each other, and as St. Paul shared his very self with the Thessalonians, and as my friend and I share a deep and genuine friendship together, so too is God inviting you to live life with others in an intentional and purposeful way. Like we're creating these life groups because it's what Jesus did. Because it's what he's, he did, it's how the disciples lived. And we want to live our lives modeled after that. If Jesus did it, we should want to do it too. If he already paved the way for us to live in this type of community, to have these friendships that he had with the apostles, he showed us that it's possible. And now we're being invited to consider that for ourselves and to consider that for our parish. So right now, I want to actually move into a time of personal reflection. I've talked a lot, so now you don't have to worry about listening to me for a little bit. So I want to move into a time of personal reflection, and I'm going to put the questions up here momentarily. And then we'll go into a time of just small group discussion. So first, for your own reflection, I want you to ask yourself, but also ask Jesus. Like, actually make it a prayer. Like, what is stirring or resonating? with me right now? Are there people in my life that I already have this kind of relationship with or that I could have this kind of relationship? Who do I want to invite into my village? So I'm going to put the questions up there and give you maybe about 10 minutes to just take this into prayer. Ask yourself and ask Jesus these questions. And then I'll prompt you after about 10 minutes to, to go into some uh, like small groups, just four or five people, people who are sitting around you. And I'll put up some small group questions for discussion as well. Um, so you don't have to think about what those questions are right now. I'll have them up on the screen. Uh, so right now, I just want to yeah, encourage you just to sit with yourself and with Jesus and to ask the questions. And I'll put them up momentarily. So it's been about 10 minutes, just under. So we're just going to move into a time of small group um, discussion. So I would just encourage you to just turn around to a few people that are beside you. Feel free to get up and go to one of the um, like circles of chairs over there, too. Like That's totally fine. We're going to just have these questions. So what resonated with you about the need for people to share life with? Like, Why did that resonate? What about sharing life with other people draws you to the idea of life groups? And what do you think it would look like at St. Morris if in two years' time, 80% of parishioners experienced these kinds of relationships within the parish? So you have the questions. We'll share for about 15, 20 minutes. Feel free to move about if that's helpful, and then I'll bring everyone back just for some closing remarks. So feel free to go ahead.
is there, yeah, two or three brave volunteers you just want to share something of uh, what you um, spoke in your small group? Yes. Being at church, I don't need the microphone. Being at church, whether mm -hmm. you've been here for a short time or a long time, and you can come into church and know a lot of faces and know a lot of people, and they may know your circumstances, but you're right, there's no, there's no... Genuine. Or the connection, or not the, 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 the deep. Not that people don't care, but yeah. Yeah, the, the authentic, the I can be real with you type of connection, yeah. Yes? Well, you need time. Time to get together. I, I, I'm starting a Bible study with four people that are not from the parish, they're all over the place. But we've got a connection, and it's taken time. It's taken almost two years, and it's, it's fantastic. That's amazing. And you're exactly right. It takes time. Like I shared the example with my friend and I, it was like 10 years ago that we met, five years of being acquaintances and being around each other before we actually had an experience that allowed us to go deeper. And even still, it's five years of living that out before we both were able to say just four weeks ago, literally, I think four weeks on a Thursday, that I have freedom to be real with you. That I can actually share the things that I wouldn't necessarily share with, like she's a mom of two little ones. She's like, I can't necessarily be as real with my mom's group as I can with just you, because there's just something different. And it takes time. And that's why even just this, um, these life groups, this isn't like the full launch of it. This is the pilot of it, because we know it actually takes time to form and develop and even just logistically know what does this look like. Is there maybe one other person, Peter? That actually follows what you just said. So one of the questions we have as a in group discussion is like, what exactly we are getting into by <laughs> Good question. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, that's perfect. And maybe we'll like, I'll start kind of wrapping up there and I'll be available for questions afterwards. I'll be, um, uh, I'll still be around so you can come up and ask me questions. Um, but really when we look ahead to these life groups, like these are groups of like six to 10, maybe 12, um, just people where you meet together on a regular basis. Now, whether that's once a month, whether that's once a week, whether that's for an hour or two hours, it's actually really up to you and your group. Maybe you're meeting over a meal, over lunch, and you go out to the same place, or you're meeting for coffee after the 9 a.m. Wednesday mass. Or maybe you're meeting in the evening once the kids are on bed for an hour, once a month. Really what these life groups are is an opportunity to just be intentional in gathering to share. It's not you being here saying, I've signed up to be a leader and I'm gonna lead this whole thing. No, that's not what we're asking. These, the series, these five weeks, are really actually just for you to be able to begin discerning, Lord, who are you inviting me to share life with? And maybe there are people here who are like, yeah, I for sure want to be the facilitator of a group, which basically means you're a point of contact for me. And maybe you're helping to facilitate like, the sharing within the group. But also, if you're with people that you know or you're building relationship, sometimes that can come naturally even just within the group. But the facilitator that we've been talking about, that Father Ben has mentioned, is really actually a point of contact for me as the life group's ministry coordinator, to have to know how many people in the parish are in life groups, how many people outside of the parish are in these life groups. Hey, do you and your group need a little bit of coaching or accompaniment in kind of how to move forward or want resources? Come to me. I, ha I love that stuff. Let me help you. So really, like, we're not saying now you're going off and you're for sure every single one of you has to start your own. Nope. If you're like, I don't know where to start, but I really, really want to be in. But maybe over these next few weeks, you find someone even here that's like, I do want to start my own. And hey, I like you. There seems to be some kind of connection here. 
maybe that is where you're like, hey, can I be a part of your life group? And then maybe there are people that you know that you're like, yeah, I want to invite this person in my life too, to be in here. But that's what these five weeks are for, is to hear the vision of what this could look like and to allow the Father, to allow Jesus to stir in your own heart, what does this mean for me? And really, the the life groups are meant to be more than just a prayer group or a Bible study. It really is meant to be a place to live life together, an intentional and purposeful place to live life together. And again, there's probably some of you here that are already doing that, and that is amazing. Like we heard on Sunday from Mary Sheridan, she and her group have been doing it for 25 plus years. They probably didn't start that one day after, like when their pastor said, like, you should start a prayer group and think this is going to last 25 years. (laughs) They probably thought, let's try it for a year. (laughs) But it just, the Lord allowed it to last that long. And so maybe it's for a season in your life. Maybe it is for your life. But the point is, is that right now, it's to who are you living life? Who do you want to be a part of? of your village. Maybe it is someone who doesn't actually know anyone yet and you're saying, come in. Or maybe it is people who you do already know and are living life together and you're like, let's be intentional in this. And my role is just to help coach and accompany you, to coach and accompany your group, to help you find people if you're like, I don't know. So maybe I know people who have signed up that said, just put me in a group. And I'm like, great, I know someone who wants to lead that group. That's my role. And so for you, in these next five weeks, if you continue to come, it's a place of discernment as well, of just, hey, Lord, who do you have for me? And these small group discussions, the personal reflections over these next five weeks will also help facilitate that for you as well, to get you thinking about that. So you're not thinking, I'm leaving today and have to have a whole plan in my head. No. These next five weeks, allow them if you're able to come for all of it, or if you're able to come for a few, that's why we're also recording them, so that they can be available later. See what we did there? (laughs) But it's meant to be a process. And really, like, I was reflecting on this last night as I was kind of preparing my notes for today, and I was just thinking, like, this is new. And new is exciting. New is also messy. When you're building something new, you're like, this is so cool. But then you're like, oh, but then this thing, and then this thing, and then this thing, and what about that thing? It can also be messy. But actually, let's embrace the mess. If it's the Lord's plan, it's an organized mess. And all of you who are here tonight, whether you're only able to come for tonight, whether you're coming for two or three or all the sessions, you're a part of the mess. So thanks. <laughs> thanks for taking the risk and stepping out and being here tonight. Because to be fully honest and transparent, I don't have all the answers yet. This is a work in progress. This is a pilot <laughs> for a reason. So as we go through these next five weeks, these are the sessions that we're going to be sharing on. So the bolded one is tonight, right here, right now that you've just finished. But over these next four remaining weeks, we'll be talking about how do we foster spirituality of communion and authenticity? How are life groups actually able to bring about a new expression to evangelization? The art of accompaniment. Now, maybe you've heard me say a few times, accompany. It's a big word right now in the, in the church, the art of accompaniment, asking good questions. And that gets a little bit more into a bit of a practical of about facilitating groups. But then actually we'll go into the last where I'll be back up here with the microphone, which is a little scary, talk about the actual practicals of if you've made it this far and you're like, all right, what is the next step? Well, that's where I hopefully will have some answers for you. So that's it for me. Thank you all for entering into the newness. 
Thank you for entering into the mess with me, for taking that risk, for stepping out. Um, I'm very excited, and again, I'm like convicted that this is something that the Lord is really doing in our parish at this time. Life groups at 60, as Father Lawrence said, one of his final words, it's like, that is what I'm like, yeah, life groups at 60, come on, let's go. So I'm going to invite Father Ben up just to give a final uh, prayer and blessing over us. Let's thank Stephanie for all her work. And... <laughs> thank you, Stephanie. Stephanie's been stewing in this for a number of months, too. She's when the idea was started to surface there of, of life groups. And uh, yeah, it's a, it's a process, it's a journey. And we're trying to learn, as in the context of a pilot group, how is this going to be best, what's the best way to organize this and equip people and, and uh, so, that, so that this can be fruitful in the parish and be a blessing to so many. So, so anyways, I'm glad you took the risk and came out. Thank you for saying yes to the Lord and to our invitation. And God has a great adventure, I know, for all of us. And uh, where it goes, who knows? But uh, the Lord is with us. So God be with you as you have a good, good week. And uh, and so we just pray in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We thank you, Jesus, for the opportunity you've given us tonight to gather in your name, Lord, and for even new friends that we make tonight, Jesus. We thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to share from the heart, Lord, what's going on in our lives, Jesus. And this vision for, for, for spirituality of communion, Lord, for the parish at St. Morris. We just ask you, Lord, if this be part of your vision, your plan, Lord, to just bring a fruitfulness to all of this, Lord. Send your Holy Spirit. Fill us with your Holy Spirit and give us wisdom and guidance and grace, Lord, and courage and love, every grace we need so that we can continue to walk in, in your perfect will, Lord, and in your plans for, for, for St. Morris. And so I bless all of you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go and evangelize the world. Tonight, yes. <laughs>